Hi, I'm uh, Sasha Hasselmeyer and I'm a partner at Ashoka and I'm here with Christiana Bucalo. Christiana, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, um, hi everyone. I'm very happy to be here virtually. Um, my name is Christiana, Christiana Bucalo. I am the initiator and co-founder of State Free. Um, we are an organization that works on statelessness and that's something you will learn more about in the next few minutes. And I'm very happy to be here today. Christiana, the, the, the very first question, of course, has to be, what is statelessness and why is it so urgent that uh, our viewers and listeners are hearing about it now? And so when it comes to statelessness, in general, statelessness describes the status of people who don't have a citizenship. That means that a stateless person is not recognized as a citizen by any nation. And I um, like to emphasize this part about being not being recognized, because in this constellation, it's very important to understand that it's not the individual who decides um, which nation I belong to, but it is the state who decides whether or not you are recognized. So it's not a two-way street. And status that describes the status of people who are not recognized, so they don't have a citizenship. And um, as the world that we are living in um, is in a situation in which it is citizens who get certain access to rights, um, and the majority of the rights that we want to access are actually tied to us being citizens and not so much to us being human beings. Um, stateless people live in a situation in which they have very, very limited access to very basic human rights. So stateless people might not have access to identity documentation, they might not have access to um, the education system, to health system, and they don't have freedom to travel can't really participate in politics because they don't have the right to vote. So a lot of limitations that stateless people face. Um, currently, we know there is an estimate of 15 million people worldwide who are stateless. And despite the fact that it's so many people who are affected by it, almost nobody knows about it. And that actually also, just to um, respond to your second question about why should we learn about statelessness, I think um, every individual should have the right to understand that while we live in a nation state context, um, nation states don't always provide citizenship to everyone. And, um, citizen and citizenship, but also statelessness is something that um, is very much in the power of and decision-making power of states. So every one of us can be affected at some point. Currently, there's an estimate of 15 million people. Um, in Germany, for example, we have a number of over 126,000 people who are without citizenship, and yet nobody knows about it. And that's why we think um, that there is a need for a broader awareness around this world so that we can all contribute for one to a world in which status people have access to things, but also contribute to our knowledge and understanding of what democracy is right now and how it should definitely be improved. I think if you'd asked me, you know, how many stateless people do I think are there in the world or our viewers and listeners, they would have probably estimated something like 120,000, maybe, you know, if, you, if you're not informed. So 15 million is really the size of, of a serious country. And, yeah. um, and I've seen really powerful um, poster campaigns in Berlin by your organization that really kind of reminded me every day how random um, in a way it is, because as you describe, you can get born into statelessness and not recover from that. So um, maybe to start with, how did you get involved in this topic? Yeah, a very good and very important question. Um, so I started this work as soon as I understood that it is a systemic and structural issue and is not an individual case. And I'm emphasizing this because I'm also a person who's affected by statelessness. So I was um, born in Germany um, and was categorized as a person without citizenship from the start and have since been stateless. And despite that biography in that sense, I never really understood that I'm not the only person. So I always thought that me and I have two young sisters and we are the only ones. And um, due to a very, very intense and also in some parts traumatizing travel experience that I made, I then started researching more around statelessness. And what I found out while researching was that um, it is not just us, but that currently or currently back then that was... Uh, three or four years ago, we had a number of, or a total number of 117,000 people in Germany 
who were stateless, a lot of children and minors also. Um, and this understanding of the fact that this is something that affects many people, and yet it is super hard to understand how to deal with the situation, that led to me feeling this urge of wanting to change something because it's one thing to be stateless, but then it's a completely other thing to don't even to not even get access to the information that you would need in order to deal with your statelessness. And you already mentioned it um, briefly that there are various reasons for statelessness. So there's a, I'd say, broad diversity also of um, people who are stateless and biographies that then um, become stateless. So one is being born into statelessness. So statelessness is something that is being inherited also, which obviously makes it very hard to end this vision circle. And then in general, every state is free to decide. So it's the sovereign state that decides under which circumstances citizenship is granted or denied. In some countries, we have examples like in the US, you are born in the US, you are a US citizen. But then in Germany, for example, that's not, the, that's not the case. You're not simply born to Germany and then you get German, but it's more about your ancestry. So it's about your parents. And can you inherit the German citizenship? And um, other causes for statelessness are war um, and the dissolution the, the of states. So people from the former Soviet Union, former Yugoslavian, um, often are affected by statelessness. Then discriminatory nationality law. So there are countries in which certain groups are simply excluded. Or there are countries also in which, um, for example, women don't have the same rights to pass on the citizenship to their children. So that's the case in over 24 uh, countries. So, for example, women from Iran or Syria don't have the right to pass on the citizenship to the children. And then the child ends up being stateless if the father is unknown. Um, so coming maybe from the reasons to why did I start this work? Obviously, those are reasons that can affect every one of us. And then again, it's none of our fault. Um, it is politics and state dynamics then that then lead to statelessness and we know the political can be very personal and in this context what happens on the political spectrum um, has so much influence on the individual that then becomes stateless and has zero right and capacity to belong to a societal structure based on what is happening on the political level and that's why I became active in this field. Yeah, and I think it's it's worth noting also, given that our audience here are the creative bureaucrats of the world, um, that you're not a migration lawyer or a human rights lawyer. You're not a someone who's been a statelessness activist for your own life. Um, so, uh, like you said, you you started getting involved in this um relatively late in your young life um mm -hmm. and uh, when you experienced what this really means and and the the isolation that comes with it and then went to do something about it and start an organization um and that's of course what we love about people like you you know social entrepreneurs who are engaged citizens who then take actions and set out to solve a problem so i'd love you to tell us what's state free is and what state free does and uh, the kind of thinking that drives your approach to solving this problem. Yes, um, thank you for the question. So I do think it's um, important to know that we have made a certain uh, development and transformation when it comes to how we started versus where we are now. So I also already briefly mentioned this travel experience that I made. So I tried to travel to Morocco to Marrakesh. And when I landed in Marrakesh, I was confronted with the fact that I'm not allowed to enter the country and was forced to stay at the airport for 20 hours until the next flight back to Germany left. And what happened there was I was brought into that situation because I couldn't find the information that I would have needed to understand that I needed a specific visa because I researched beforehand. So I reached out to the embassy, I reached out to the um, to the foreigner's office in Germany and nobody responded. So what was lacking was the information that I needed to deal with the statelessness. So our or my initial thought was, if there are so many stateless people, 15 million people worldwide, all of us have different experiences. Why is there no space for us to come together and kind of combat the isolating experience of statelessness and then learn from each other and support each other. So when we started Safe Free, our main goal was to provide a space in which we could build community with each other, get in contact with each other, but not only as status people, but also with those who work on the issue. Because I started researching and suddenly I found organizations that worked on the issue, 
but they were not in contact with stateless people, which was very confusing to me. Um, so currently we've grown since then. And currently our vision is that one day every stateless person feels like they belong. And our mission is to empower stateless people through community, visibility, and equal rights. And those three um, points also reflect our pillars, the pillars that we work on. So community means that we bring together stateless people. We launched the first online forum globally that provides a space for stateless people to come together. But we also um, provide spaces um, on site for community members that are able to travel um, and community labs and bring together status people to work together on certain issues that we do as an organization. The second pillar is visibility because you can't solve a problem without it being visible. And unfortunately, nobody knows that statelessness exists. Oftentimes, even people in politics or also public administration. So we want to create more awareness and educate people on what statelessness means. And then the third pillar is equal rights because we know that um, for people to really experience belonging, and empowerment, they need to have access to very basic rights. So we need to also change the structure in which stateless people are living and the structure with which they are confronted. So that means that in this area, we do a lot of political advocacy. That was our focus last year. Um, now, going forward, we will also engage more in political innovation, meaning that we don't only want to like talk about possible solutions and, and recommend possible solutions, but then actually work on drafting and prototyping solutions with the hope of then um, having a certain demonstration to destruct uh, to politics in the sense of how can we change things so that status people get access um, to belonging in our society so i think all the creative bureaucrats love this idea of experimenting and piloting new solutions and i hope they they reach out to you um, I just want to highlight a, a couple of things that stood out to me of the many, many things you said just now. Um, and I think one of them is that you described your sense of isolation. And in many ways, the word statelessness means a person with no agency, really. You're, 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 the word kind of signals you're at the bottom of the of the rights chain in many ways. And so the idea that you're organizing this community, connecting um, stateless people like yourself um, to have a sense of belonging and create more and more space to participate all the way to prototyping solutions. It's just extraordinary how much room you've been able to create for a community that's not supposed by definition to have that room. Um, and I wonder if... Um, if we um, think about the relationship of the stateless people and bureaucracies, um, I'm sure we could now go into a very, very, very long um, list of all the things that are wrong. And you described it yourself. You didn't get access to the right information, even though you tried to be informed, you tried to, to make the right choices on your, on your trip to Morocco. Um, can you outline a little bit what the relationship is between stateless people and bureaucracies and maybe if you have some ideas or some example what's working already what can be done what can a bureaucracy do even when they cannot write the laws that yeah. that govern citizenship yeah ah, um so in terms of what is the relationship now um I think I will be wearing two hats to respond to this question. So in my uh, Christiana as an individual um, person who grew up in Germany hat, I have to say that the relationship is really tough. Um, it has been extremely intense, unfortunately, in a negative way. Um, with the other hat, which often, obviously also in some cases interacts with <laughs> the individual hat, I have in the last couple of years also been able to understand more why that is the case and that is simply because people who work in the public administration so it's not the bureaucracy's fault that politics doesn't provide the right guidance and i think what we are what we're seeing here is two parties in a sense stateless people and those who work in the offices who also are very frustrated with the lack of a sufficient system that supports them in solving the solution so um, one of the main issues, and I will just outline the issue before I come to what works because it is connected. And one of the main issues when it comes to statelessness is in terms of international law, we do have a structure. So we have uh, UN conventions uh, that talk to the rights of stateless people. 
Um, the problem is we are lacking a system to recognize stateless people as stateless, meaning we have a category of people who are recognized as stateless, and then we have a category of people who are also without nationality, but we don't know how to recognize them. And that is a procedure that is missing. In in other countries, it's, um, it's called the statelessness determination procedure. And now the issue is that even if... Uh, in bureaucracy, we would like to give access to status people. We don't know how to recognize them as such. So we can't give them access to the rights that are stated in the convention. And that's been a huge issue. So for example, in Germany, from like if we look at the total number of 126,000 people who are affected, only 97,000 are, no, other way around, sorry, 29,000 are not recognized as stateless, um, are recognized as stateless and only, uh, Okay, I messed that up. <laughs> I don't want to confuse you even more. So 126,000 people are stateless, but only 29,000 are recognized as stateless. And the other group, 97,000, are in this category of an undetermined nationality. And there are cases, obviously, 29,000 cases, in which people were recognized as stateless. And those are the positive examples. And what we can see in those examples is that we had people working at the public offices and public authorities who had expertise in this area and who were able to imagine what statelessness means and understand, okay, a stateless person, a stateless person doesn't have access to a birth certificate. So when it comes to proving your identity, we need to have other measures because obviously every person exists and every person has an identity, but currently the system that we're living in oftentimes assumes a person without certain documents doesn't have a legal identity. But what is a legal identity versus a like a social construct that is identity? So if we have a person who was born in Germany stateless that doesn't get a birth certificate because of their statelessness, but we have other data about that person, are there other ways for us to recognize the identity of that person and then give them access? So there have been 29,000 cases in which we had positive examples of how um, bureaucracy can support status people, but this needs to be systemized and um, improved in the future. So, um, so one thing I hear from what you're talking about, and I remember this from our um, preparation conversation, you said it's extraordinary that professionals at international agencies who are supposedly specialized in statelessness don't really engage with stateless people and therefore lack the lived experience that that your community brings to the table and um and i think this is just such a kind of powerful example of how even a, a kind of very fragmented community of people with lived experience can be organized into something that then is ready to work with um, our bureaucracies to kind of begin to solve these problems and create the space so um as a closing question, I would love to um, set our our minds to the year 2045 in the spirit of this year's Creative Bureaucracy Festival. What would you like to have happened in the world of bureaucracies, citizenship, so that in 2045 you feel our job is done here or there's even more we can contribute? Yeah. Um, so one of the main, I'd say, obstacles of having not solved statelessness yet, I think is also because state or state slash bureaucracy have worked, I don't want to say in opposition, but at least not together with those who are experiencing things. So you already mentioned the lived experience. And I think in order for us to have an effective and long lasting sustainable solution, both need to work together. So what will have happened until 2045, I, in my perspective, what has to happen, and I think we are already trying to work towards this, um, is that we bridge between the different kinds of knowledge that exists in this space. We bridge between politicians, bureaucrats, stateless people, academia, lawyers, and so forth, all of those who have had different connections to statelessness so that we build a system that works for all of those different parties. Um, we are currently working on that by trying to start and prototype how a statelessness determination procedure could look like in the future, a digital one even. And for in this process, we are actually now bringing those different groups together. Um, in the next few years, years, I think what will have happened is that we gain another understanding or a broader understanding of what identity means, 
what citizenship means and also how we want to contribute to a world in which we belong. Currently, citizenship is often used as a tool to define who doesn't belong. And maybe at a certain stage in time, we will understand that citizenship is not a limited good, but it's something that we can share with each other because nobody loses a citizenship if another person gains citizenship. And nobody loses rights, human rights, if another person also has human rights. And just broadening our sense of the fact that we are on this world to share this world, and that also counts for the rights that we have as people. And so... In future, I think we will have a status as determination procedure that allows people to get recognized as status and then eventually end their statelessness. And having this procedure in a sense that it aligns with the needs and vision of the different parties in, in our system, meaning stateless people, meaning the state, meaning bureaucracy, and all the other groups. Christiana, thank you for this. Um... I'm so proud that, that we at Ashoka can support you as an Ashoka Fellow. Um, I hope that many of the creative bureaucrats who've listened to our conversation here today will reach out to you. Um, we hope to have you at the Creative Bureaucracy Festival in Berlin in person and give people a chance to think about how they can become part of your labs, your prototypes and your, your pilots. And um, I'm really, really grateful for everything you do and for inspiring us with not just describing a problem, but showing us the value, the human value in this problem and the incredible potential we can unleash if we work together. So thank you, Christiana. Thank you. And thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>